Father God, you are worthy of it all. We praise you, Lord, because you have done for us all the things that we could not do for ourselves, Lord. Lord, teach us to walk worthy of the calling to which you have called us for your glory. Speak to your people through me, your servant, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray and give you all the glory, honor, and praise. The word of the Lord from this morning comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, verses 1 through 3. And since we're only going to be dealing with three verses, we're going to do things a little bit differently in the sense I'm going to just go ahead and read those three verses right now and um, just kind of put them up front. And then we obviously have a slide with those verses. Uh, then we'll just kind of talk and teach through those verses and let the Lord have his way. Reading from the New King James Version, you will find these words, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The subject for today's message is the proper response to His amazing grace. Amen. When someone gives us a gift, it is customary for the recipient to respond. The proper response generally flows from the value of the gift and an assessment of the sacrifice involved in the giving of the gift. The greater the value of the gift, and the greater the sacrifice of the giver, the greater the response that is merited. While the response may never equal the sacrifice involved in the giving of the gift, it should reflect genuine gratitude for the giver and an appropriate appreciation of the gift. God is the giver of both life and salvation. To those whom he has called and chosen, Though unworthy we were, he has demonstrated his unsurpassable love by giving us an abundance of riches of his glory. There is only one proper response to such amazing grace. To walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called. By way of background, now that we've concluded our journey through the book of Acts, I remind you in Acts 28, we, we, we leave Paul as he's in uh, Roman imprisonment. And during that two-year period where Paul was staying in his own rented quarters during this first imprisonment in Rome, he wrote the letter to the church here at Ephesus. And as with several of Paul's letters, Ephesians begins with a doctrinal teaching, just wonderfully rich statements about who we are in Christ and the new identity and all of our blessings. Chapters 1 through 3 contain just wonderful truths that really help us understand who we are in the Lord. But in chapter 4, Paul kind of does a pivot, and that's something that Paul often does in many of his letters. And he switches from the doctrine to the duty, and he gives his audience instructions and imperatives about how they should be walking worthy of their calling. Section 1. The proper response to the amazing grace of the Lord is to walk worthy of the calling out of a heart filled with gratitude for the giver and the gift. And we'll be looking at verse 1 for section 1. So one of the things that you will notice as you look at verse 1 in Ephesians 4 is the therefore. Oftentimes, and I'm sure you've heard this from other folks, when you see the therefore, you should kind of ask as a student of the word, what is the therefore, therefore? Here Paul is building upon some rich teachings as we've kind of teed up in chapters 1 through 3. And these teachings are important for Paul to leverage because Paul is a person, in terms of the way the Lord has gifted him and the way the Holy Spirit inspires him, it's a man of great intelligence and great intellect, and he uses a lot of very dense, complicated arguments to explain things to people. And so he wants you to understand that what he's about to exhort you to do, to urge you to do, to implore you to do, is based upon what's already been done for you. Section 1A, subsection 1, Paul desires that its audience know the hope of their calling, the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of Christ's power toward believers. That comes to me from Ephesians 1, verse 18. I just want to park for a second on the hope of their calling. See, see, Paul wants you to know 
that although you have received certain blessings here, and he's going to, again, talk about these in chapters 1 through 3. I'm going to take a brief tour through those first three chapters. But although you've received certain things, what is yet to come is greater than anything that you're experiencing now. And Paul wants you to have a hope in the absolute certainty that everything that God has promised you, although you may not yet have seen it all come to pass, you may not have seen your healing come to pass here on earth, you may not have seen certain other things that you're going through be removed from, you may not have received it yet, but you will receive it. So he wants them to have a hope. That those things that we have been called to, being united in the presence of Christ, not just having the spirit of Christ indwelling us, but actually being in the presence of Christ, he wants you to have absolute certainty that that will come to pass. Amen. Subsection 2, the calling to which Christians have been called, the language that he uses there in verse 1, it's a calling both to salvation and a call to membership in the body of Christ. We are called by and to the person of Christ, called to follow the way of Christ, called into the kingdom of Christ, and called into the body of Christ. Oftentimes when you study this passage and you see calling being used in certain New Testament writings, they're, they're usually just talking about salvation. But here Paul's trying to make a deeper point. When you were saved, yes, yes, you were saved by Christ. You came now into union with Christ, but you're not alone because you're in the kingdom of Christ and there are fellow citizens. Look around, my brothers and sisters, you're not alone. You're not alone. We all who are in Christ are fellow members of the body of Christ. And Paul wants you to understand that because some of the things that he's going to do in terms of developing this argument, as you continue to look beyond Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 and look at the rest up to verse 16 in chapter 4, you'll see he's talking about the unity of believers. And so it's important for you to kind of understand, to understand what Paul is saying, that you haven't just been called to salvation. You've been called to membership in a body. Whose head is Jesus the Christ? Yes, 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 yes. Subsection 3, the Christian life, it's the process of developing into becoming who God has already made us to be as we progressively come to comprehend and live out our new identity and live from all the blessings that attach to that identity. As our minds get renewed and we grow in wisdom and knowledge of Jesus, our living is progressively transformed to better reflect our new identity. This, this is not new. This is not original. Anything that I'm saying, y'all, what God did for us is so hard for us to comprehend. It takes a minute. It takes a minute to catch up with it. See, that's the process that Paul talks about. He talks about later in Ephesians, and then we know the famous verse from Romans 12 to be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. And how? By the renewing of your minds. See, God does the transformation, but we have to cooperate in the renewal. We have to cooperate by staying in our words, staying in fellowship, staying in prayer, doing all the things that God has called us to do so that we can get our minds to catch up to what God has already done. See, the Bible teaches that we were an old creation, but that's passed away. Now we're new creation, new creatures. Right? The old is gone, but you know what? There's some things that remain. To quote Pastor Alistair Begg, you got something called the flesh, and it no longer reigns, but it remains. And you got to deal with it during the rest of your days here on this earth. And your flesh is affecting your mind. It's affecting your ability to see who you have been made to be in Christ. And Paul wants you to shake out of that doldrum. He wants you to get past any deception and false teaching and misunderstandings. He wants you to know your new identity in Christ. And so Paul, again, he does a lot of work in the first three chapters. And I'm just going to kind of touch on a few things. Now, these things I'm going to touch upon, they're all from Ephesians 1 through 3. They're not on your handout. I'm going to go a little bit fast for the sake of time. But I encourage you each, brothers and sisters, as you're led by the Spirit, spend some time. Spend some time in the coming week going back through Ephesians 1 through 3. I mean, it's just everything in the New Testament, everything in the entire book of the Word of God is rich. But there are a lot of things in that particular three chapters that will really help you to start getting your mind renewed about who you really are. 
And so again, talking about new identity, again, we're just going to kind of speed walk through some of these things. You've been adopted as sons and daughters of God. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. I mean, you could just kind of park there for a second, right? You've been adopted as a son of daughter of God. So, so you know, again, you got to understand the backstory here. We were created by God. We sinned and rebelled against God. That separated us from God. Not from the love of God, because God wasn't going to let anything separate us from his love. Right? But it separated us from God in such a way that there was punishment that had to be inflicted on someone for what we had done with our sins. At that point, we were not sons and daughters of God. We were rebels. Right? In open act of rebellion to our creator. And God says, I'm going to provide a way through my son for you to have that penalty paid that you couldn't pay for yourself because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I'm going to provide that way. And I'm now going to invite you into my family. You're going to be sons and daughters. Paul goes on again. He's building. He's building so many just rich just nuggets of spiritual insight to teach us about this new identity. He later says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 7, that we've been made alive in Christ. This concept of we were dead in our trespasses, but now we have been raised up with him, seated with him, and saved through faith in him. Then he goes in Ephesians 2, 10, he talks about we're now his works, works, workmanship, and we're created for good works. God was always our creator, but now he has done a special work in those of us who are among the left, the Christians, the believers. He's done this special work because now we are specifically created because we've got this new nature, new identity. We're created for good works. What else has he done as far as this new identity? He brought us near by the blood of Christ. That's Ephesians 2.13. See, in that, in that part, Paul's talking about specifically for the Gentiles. You, you were far from God, right? You know, the people that were near to God were the ones, the Israelites, the Jewish people, the people that he had chosen as his chosen people to bring his son into the world. So they were near, in in this biblical language, we were far. But we who have our lineage outside of Judaism, we now have been brought near. And then he goes on to say, near unto what? A new man. That's Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. God basically in this passage is saying through Paul that here's what I've done. My son Jesus has created a new man by establishing peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. Those under that old covenant, those under the new covenant, we're going to merge them together into one. That's a new man. There's no longer, the Bible talks about no longer enmity between the Jew and the Gentile. The Jews thought they were special because they followed the law, right? They, they kept the commandments. They, they had this covenant with God and God said, no, all along my plan was to extend that. It was a mystery, but all along my plan was to extend that to all of humanity. God desires that no one no one perish, but that everyone be saved. So God has always had in mind a means to make sure that everyone had a path to salvation in him, if they were so willing. So as part of being a new man, Paul kind of, again, gives us some more facts in Ephesians uh, two nineteen. for example. He says, we're fellow citizens of the saints. In Ephesians 2.21, he says, Now you are part of a holy temple in the Lord, a dwelling of God in the Spirit. In Ephesians 3.6, he tells us, We're fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. It, It may not always seem like it, but you are not who you used to be, brothers and sisters. You're not. You may do some of the old things still that you used to do, but you are not that person. Let that just sink into your spirits. So Paul, again, just kind of continuing this tour through Ephesians 1 through 3, he, he wants his audience to know, not only have they been given a new identity, but they've been given something more and he talks about all these blessings so subsection four here there's both an improper 
and a proper response to the amazing grace of God in redeeming us and uniting us with him and making available to us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And that's from Ephesians 1.3, that language of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I, I think sometimes it's helpful when you see alls and everys and nuns and no ones to just stop for a second. And, and really let the spirit minister. What, what does that mean? Every spiritual blessing every not some not few not a couple every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is now made available to you as part of your union with Christ what is it that you could need my brother and sister that God can't provide what kind of blessing is it that you think is impossible for our God? If you need some more joy, there's a path to having joy. If you need some more peace, there's a path to having peace. If you need to be more loving, there's a path to having more love. Whatever the spiritual blessing that you're seeking, it's available to you. That's so important for you to understand. Then Paul, besides just giving that blanket phrase of every spiritual blessing, he gives us some more specifics throughout the first three chapters of Ephesians. Uh, again, we'll just take a, a quick tour. In Ephesians 1, 4, he said, you've been made holy and blameless before God. You know, in that movie, uh, Jerry Maguire, the, the famous line is, you know, you had me at hello. Right? That's a famous line for those who remember that movie. And I think about God. I think about my own sins. I think about my own struggles with sins. I, I think about just my own life. The fact that God said, you know what? I, I, I know all the things you've been doing. The things that people have seen, the things people haven't seen. I know the state of your heart. I, I know that you are a wretch. I know that you're dirty. I know that you're filthy. I know all the things about you that you don't want anybody else to know. I'm going to love you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to give you a new identity. I'm going to give you a new walk. I'm going to give you a new talk. I'm going to make you holy and blameless before me. But what else? He didn't just stop there. He, he gives us more and more blessings. He redeemed us through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That's Ephesians 1.7. He made known to us the mystery of his will. That's Ephesians 1.9. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit as a pledge of our inheritance. Ephesians 1.13-14. I'll park there for a second. Don't let this one just kind of uh, fly over your head. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. He's a down payment, y'all. Th this is God giving us a down payment for what's to come. I, I know you might be a little bit shaky in understanding this new identity. Maybe the enemy's attacking you and giving you a lot of doubts about whether you're in Christ. Is this really what's happened? Has God been that good to me? I know I was a wretch. I agree with you on that, Lord. But I didn't know you could save a wretch like me. So he says, okay, I understand your fears. I understand your doubts. See, we have a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. Go and check Hebrews about that. So he says, I will give you my spirit as a comforter, as a counselor, as a teacher, but also as a down payment for the inheritance that is to come. This is why there's a hope for the calling. It's not a hope based in a lack of evidence. There's evidence we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. What else did he do, preacher? He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. We said that, but he, he, he made us a recipient of the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 2.7. And finally, he gave us access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 2.18. Now we can come boldly before the throne. Yeah. Yeah. I understand, brothers and sisters, we struggle every day with sin. Yeah. The Bible is clear. If you confess your sins... He will be faithful to forgive you and cleanse you from all righteousness. Go boldly to the throne. When you're struggling with some things, don't let the enemy make you run away from God. Run to God. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. And now that Christ has done all that he's done for us, we have access to the Father. Use that access. Use that access. Take advantage of what he's done for you. Again, we're still looking at 
verse 1 and just trying to understand all that God is packing into these three verses. So letter B, Paul mentions being the prisoner of the Lord to strengthen his imperative. Some translations say urge, some say implore, some say beseech. But it's an imperative, an exhortation for Christians to walk worthy of their calling. See, see Paul wants you to kind of understand a couple things about him. He has apostolic authority. See, see, like you and me, brother, at some point on that road to Damascus, Brother Scott kind of talked about this. He, he, he met Jesus. He had an encounter with the Lord. And it became very clear to him that all that self-righteousness that he thought was making him somebody had left him being a nobody all along. But see, he met the only somebody who can take a nobody, clean him up and turn him around so that nobody goes out and tells everybody about that somebody who can save anybody. See, he was a, an apostle, but see, he was also authentic. Authentic. Subsection 1 here says, though in prison in and by Rome at the time, Paul understood that his chains were physically present for the cause of Christ and for the benefit of the Gentiles and spiritually representative of his union with Christ. Later in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 6.20, he actually says he's an ambassador in chains. See, see he's being authentic because there's a cost, y'all. Okay. Okay. There's a cost okay. to walking worthy. There's a cost to following the Lord. So much of our understanding of following Christ in this particular country, because we've been so blessed, has so much to do with what God has done for us that it minimizes our duty. Our duty to him based on what he's done for us. And I'm not talking legalism, y'all. I'm not talking legal. I'm talking the word. We have an apostle saying walk worthy based on all that God is walk worthy see it's going to cost you some things that you might hold dear Paul as you know we heard from all the preaching team you know about the sickness the the shipwreck you, you, you know about all these just challenging situations he had to go through the beatings the imprisonment but see for Paul he was brought by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, to a point where he did not count his life. He did not esteem himself highly. He did not. He was willing to do whatever God asked him to do to accomplish the will of God and for the glory of God. The fact that he's writing this letter to them in chains shows that authenticity, but also subsection 2 it points us to the fact that we need to esteem the value of bringing glory to the name of God and accomplishing the will of God and living pleasing to God more than we value our own lives. You see, you know, this is a matter of maturity, y'all. And this is a matter of God doing a work in your heart. This is something, you know, this word is it was working in me. Um, I confess this, this one beat me up. This one beat me up because this is one of those ones where it's a bit of a heart check. Are are you really, are you really all in, not on what God can give you, but on how you can show gratitude for everything that he's done for you? Are you all in on that? Because it may cost you some things that you hold dear. Are you to the point like Paul where you can say, whatever I had to lose for the sake of the excellency of knowing him, that's like manure to me. That's manure. That, that's just not, I'm not, mm-mm, that's, that's nothing. Nothing. He's worth that. That's why we sang, he's worthy of it all. Letter C, section one, walking worthy means living daily in a manner that is suitable for our new identity in Christ and for all that he has done for us and given to us. See, there's just, you know, let's just break down this concept of walk worthy. When we talk about walk, uh, subsection one, walk carries the idea of consistent progressive motion. We are not transformed overnight, but we should strive each day to draw closer to Christ, to grow in our knowledge of him, our willingness to do whatever he calls us to do, and our joy. Don't don't lose that, y'all. Our joy in being the recipients of such amazing grace. 
throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament, walk as a word picture, it has to do with the way we live our lives each day, our, our lifestyle, our daily conduct. And Paul is saying, I want you to keep moving. This is not something where every now and then, whether we show up well, on one particular Sunday or one particular day and do some things and think, I did my part for God. That's not what this is about when he's talking about walk worthy. No, this is progressive. This is consistent. And this is motion, y'all. A lot of us spend a lot of time in our walk with God seated. Being inactive. And I'm not just talking about serving. I'm talking about the drawing near to him. See, if you really want to be a servant, you got to get your walk right before you can get your work for him right. Otherwise, it becomes works about right, self-righteousness. So get it right first. You're drawing nearer to God that he can do a work in you. And then when he's done that work in you, he'll do that work through you. But again, we're talking about walking. Paul and you know, other writers in the New Testament that use different language. Paul, uh, 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 Elder Scott started um, his wonderful call to worship talking about enjoying running. And, you know, we talk about running the race in Hebrews. You see Paul saying in 2 Timothy, I fought the good fight. So you see these different pictures. But here the picture, just let the picture, it's walking. Yeah. Walking. Yeah. It's a walk with the Lord. If you know the footprints of the sand, sometimes it's a walk where you're being carried by the Lord. But you got to keep moving, y'all. Worthy. What, is, what does that mean? Well, uh, one, you know, way to look at it is, again, talking about it's, it's suitable. It's suitable for this new identity, for all the blessings we've been given. Uh, but another way that maybe kind of drives the point home a little bit more, the commentators point out in terms of the meaning that Paul was getting at when he wrote in Greek, it's equal weight. So subsection two here, uh, worthy carries the idea of equal weight. It points to how our daily conduct should measure up to the weight of the glory of what Christ has done for us. See, we see that picture of the scale, and you see how the scale's balanced on one hand, on one, one side of the scale. You have Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, humbling himself, coming down to earth in human form, patiently waiting nine months in a womb. God waited in a womb just so that he could be birthed to die for us. Going through all manner of things in his time on earth before his ministry even started. Then beginning his ministry and seeing his disciples who he had revealed so much about who God was to them and they still struggled with their faith. Seeing all these people that called themselves the religious experts and leaders and teachers of this day totally missed that God was walking with them and among them. All these things were happening to our Lord. And yet he still fulfilled the mission that God sent him to suffer and die. And not just die to give us again salvation, but every spiritual blessing in heaven. So measure all that up on one side of the scale. This side of the scale is how you walk. I think most of us, if we're honest, y'all, that's why this word is a tough one. And that's okay. The word of God is beautiful because it will bring you through every emotion possible. <laughs> it, it will sometimes uh, uh, do a work to convict you and reveal some things that you maybe didn't want to face. Other times when you feel all alone, it will provide a comfort and encouragement that no one else could ever bring. God will always accomplish his purpose through his word. But when we think about this walk on our end, you got to ask yourself, how can I, right? I, I don't understand how I can walk each day in a way that measures up to that. Here's a deep spiritual truth, y'all. You can't without the power of his Holy Spirit. For those of you who don't know, the Holy Spirit is the difference between living a Christian life where you experience progressively more victory, more fruit of the Spirit, more effectiveness, and living a defeated Christian life. The Holy Spirit, you can't do it in your own strength. It's absolutely impossible. That's why God had to send you some divine help. So you want to talk about how this walk can measure up to the weight of all this glory. Go back to Matthew 11, 28 through 30. 
You got to be letting God carry the heavy load. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You can't do it in your own strength, y'all. That's not what you've been called to. That's not part of the new identity. The new identity wasn't, okay, I'm going to try to earn righteousness by doing everything in my own strength. Oh, wait, I couldn't do that. God did this amazing thing for me. Save me, cleanse me, all this kind of stuff. But now I'm going to go back to trying to do it in my own strength. That's, that's not what this was about. This was about you were dead in your trespasses. You were literally made alive by the power of God so that he can fill you with his spirit. So now the life that you live, the life that you lead would be filled with the spirit, directed by the spirit, guided by the spirit, and thus become worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Equal weight. Section two. Walking worthy of the calling requires believers to love one another as Christ has loved us. And we're going to take a quick look here at verse 2. Subsection A here. First, Paul specifies three key virtues for walking worthy of our calling. All these virtues require effort by the believer in reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit. Walking worthy does not just happen. We must consciously work towards practicing these virtues daily when a worthy walk is our goal. Subsection 1, humility. Humility is the cornerstone virtue for walking worthy. It carries the idea of lowliness. While the ancient world during those days frowned upon humility, Paul came to understand its centrality to a worthy walk. Some commentators even think that Paul may be the person who was first writing about and teaching about how noble it was to be humble. Where did Paul get that from? He had met Jesus. See, all these virtues, all these virtues point us back to living a life that mirrors what Christ did and how Christ went about living because this is the way to which we have been called. We have a God who was humble enough to die. I, I, I just think, again, so many times as Christians we hear these things and we know these things and we say these things and it becomes a bit ritualistic. You, you got to take time to just afresh and anew understand the humility of God. Let, let me ask you this, for those who are parents and, you know, if you're struggling and you have some children uh, that are wayward, I would imagine you go through a range of different emotions. Uh, you know, sometimes, especially in the African American tradition, you know, um, you might hear something like, I brought you into this world. <laughs> and, and I could take you out. And see, we serve a God who, although it's very clear in Scripture, kind of wants to say that to us and hints that as, said, no, 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 I, I'm going to be humble. And we're going to talk about this. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to restrain my anger because I want you to be saved. Humility. The next virtue, gentleness or meekness, but not weakness. It flows from humility and it carries the idea of self-controlled and mild-mannered. It further speaks to the idea of having one's anger under control such that one only gets angry at the right thing and at the right time. Again, let's, let's turn back to Jesus. You know, when you look at Jesus and if you go back through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus had moments of frustration with his disciples, right? I mean, oh ye of little faith, how long do I have to endure? I've been with you all these years and you still don't yet know or understand? Right, so you see frustration, but that's not anger. You, you see an even more sense of being uh, bothered by the religious hypocrites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the zealots because of the religious hypocrisy and because of how that was deceiving the people and keeping people from understanding who God really was. But his anger, that we, we all kind of look at this, the, the time you can say he really got angry was in the temple. Yeah, in the temple. Yeah. Yeah, in the temple. Yeah. And again, for the sake of this sermon, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to give this to you all as homework. Go back and study that and understand. Why is that? Why was that the time and place that Jesus demonstrated his anger? And think about what it means to have your anger under control, to be so self-controlled. Not that you don't get angry, but that you're so self-controlled that you're only getting angry at the right thing and at the right time. Gentleness. 
patience, the third virtue that he talks about in verse 2. Uh, some translations, uh, including the New King James Version, say long-suffering. It carries the idea of a hope-driven endurance of grief as God demonstrated by holding back his wrath triggered by human sin. And there's so many verses you can look to, but it's just an easy one. I've given you a handout as Romans 2, 4, and that's where it talks about how God kind of forbear and held back on his wrath because the kindness of God was meant to lead us to repentance. Patience. Again, we can look to Christ. Not only in terms of how he was with his disciples, but how he's been throughout eternity with us. God created us because he's all-knowing, knowing what we were going to do, y'all. That was not a shock to God. Adam and Eve and what they did, the, you know, that was not news to God. God knew. God knew all of these things. And yet, out of the richness of his love, he said, now I'm going to create them, even though I know they're going to rebel from me, I'm going to provide a way for them to come back to me. But it's going to take some time. I'm going to have to wait a little bit. I'm going to have to be patient. Let it be. Next, Paul moves from the more abstract virtues to the specific application of these virtues in relationships, particularly between believers. Bearing with one another in love speaks to putting patience into practice in our relationship with fellow believers, not for hope of reciprocity, but because of a desire for the will of God to be accomplished in the one being loved. As God patiently waited for us to receive his love and turn from our sins, so too must we patiently walk with other believers who may be difficult to deal with. I, I don't know how many of y'all have been in church for a little bit. See, I, I, I'm a PK. <laughs> born and raised in church. So I've seen some things. I've seen some things. And I, I can tell you in my humanness, you know, th those are things that make you want to have nothing to do with church. Nothing to do with the people that call themselves the people of God. This passage is saying, don't think like that. I understand that they're hurting you. I understand that they're grieving you. I understand they're putting you through some things. Wait. Wait, I stay on the Lord. Wait in hope. Wait in trust. Wait in faith. Wait in prayer where you are praying for God's grace, his love to penetrate their hearts and their minds and help them come out of whatever funk and whatever bondage got them acting so nasty. Wait. Bear with them in love. Not saying you can't have some healthy boundaries. Not saying don't use wisdom and, you know, remove yourself from abusive situations. Not saying any of that. But it's saying in terms of the state of your heart, hang in there with them. Even if you're doing it at a distance, hang in there with them. Forbear, because that's what our Lord did for us. Section 3, and we'll be looking at verse 3 in Ephesians here. Believers should walk in love for one another to maintain the bond of peace established by the Holy Spirit and demonstrate to the world the praise of his glory. A few key points and then I'll take my seat. Letter A, the Holy Spirit establishes the unity among believers through the bond of peace. You have to understand when you look at this verse, y'all, we, we, can't, we can't create a bond of peace. Whether here at Hope Alliance or any other church, we can't do it. There's nothing in this text, there's nothing anywhere in Scripture that tells us that we have somehow the power, the ability, the duty, the obligation, response, any of that kind of stuff. The Bible's very clear. The Holy Spirit alone has established this bond of peace. And by bond of peace, I just want to kind of point back to Paul and talking about a prisoner in chains. Because when we talk about bonding, you kind of study the original language and try to really, through the power of the Holy Spirit, understand what was being said. A bond was a fastener. A fastener. So Paul talked about, I'm a prisoner for the Lord in verse 1. And we already talked about that. But he's here, again, because Paul is a very deep, complicated guy in the way he's thinking. He's pulling that same language when he's talking about the bond of peace. See, you're fastened together by the Holy Spirit so that you guys can walk in peace with each other. Okay? You didn't put the chains on your arms. The Holy Spirit did that. But, let her be, you must strive, labor, endeavor with zeal to maintain or protect that unity by relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in love for one another. While you did not create this bond, you can do some things that might break that bond. Why do you think we have so many different denominations? Why do you think we have so many different people with all these different ways of understanding God, worshiping God, walking with God, who don't want anything to do with other folks that are right next door that are also called by the name of God? 
what have people done? We, we did some things where we did not protect and maintain that unity that was never the will of God. God is clear about his will for us to be one for he is one. So you must protect and you got to work hard at it. See, these words strive, labor, endeavor with zeal, use due diligence. This is not something that's going to just happen. Why? Because, again, we still got that flesh, y'all. We still got that thing that we're wrestling with that's not yet been redeemed. We still got uh, uh, an enemy out here. We have Lucifer, uh, the fallen angel. We have all these other fallen angels. We have these powers and principalities that Paul later talks about in Ephesians 6 when he talks about make sure every day you're putting on the armor of God. Because you do have an enemy out here trying to steal, kill, and destroy and take you out. And affect your walk even with other believers, let alone your witness to the world. So all these things are happening. You have to be very serious and consciously committed to doing the work to maintain and protect that unity. That means it's got to be valuable to y'all. You know, we protect what's valuable. You know, especially as men, we look about it and we say, okay, you know what? Here are some things where I, I hope I don't lose, but here are some things that, you know, they're going to have to kill me to get this. Amen. They're going to have to kill me to get to my wife, get to my, somebody have to kill me. Amen. I'll lay down my life for him happily. You, you, got, you got to treat that bond of peace that we have in church like that. Yes. Yes. I, I understand some people are vexing you. I understand some people might have had a bad day and you were having a bad day too. And that caused some conflict. Conflict is going to happen. It's inevitable, y'all. But you've got to do what it takes through the power of the Holy Spirit again, but to maintain that bond of peace. Final point, final point, let us see the God-ordained destiny appointed for all believers in Christ. It's to live to the praise of his glory. And that's straight from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. Walking in unity is a central part of how God is calling us to live to the praise of his glory. Although three distinct persons, God is one. He is in perfect union with himself. He calls us to union in him, which means unity with one another as fellow members of the body of, of Christ. Such unity displays his wisdom and moral excellence to the world. Yo, I mean, there's so many reasons for us to walk worthy. It's going to benefit you. Yes. But the thing that sometimes we forget, th this is about being a witness to the world, y'all. The, the more messy we look, the more messy our God looks. And our God is not messy. He's not messy. He's pure. He's perfect. He's holy. He's righteous. He's good. He's loving. He's kind. He's, he's all of these things. And he's not calling us to be perfect in this life, but he's calling us to be walking worthy of our calling, daily making progress in a way where through the power of the Spirit, the weight of our walk is balanced by the weight of the glory of who he is, who he's made us, and all that he's done for us. I leave you with this final question. What Jesus accomplished and provided for all believers makes him worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. No matter the cost. I'll stop there for no matter the cost. Because again, brothers and sisters, this is why a lot of us don't do it. That's why a lot of us don't walk. Maybe we walk worthy in a couple areas of our lives, but there's some other things where we're not even really trying to reflect our God. We're all too comfortable with our sins, all too comfortable in a lot of mess. So it's going to cost you to walk worthy, but no matter the cost, are you grateful enough for what our Lord has done to be fully committed to living a life that demonstrates to the world the glory of our God and just how worthy our God is? All praise, glory, and honor is due to God.